to Size Matters, a fat costumer on body diversity in Austin and Austin adjacent media. I'm your fat costumer, Lacey Phillips. I'm an author and a communications professional who lives so far south in Indiana, I can see Kentucky out my front door. I founded Ace Author Chat and host that discussion on Twitter every year on the first Sunday of Ace Week in October. It's a forum for asexual and aromantic writers to discuss their work and how their sexual orientation intersects with the stories they tell. I also serve as an affiliate editor at Full Mood Mag, an online literary journal. In my free time, I enjoy sewing and making historical costumes. Just a quick note before we begin, I will be discussing bodies in this presentation, which may include having a dialogue about size, shape, and weight. I will be using the term fat frequently, as well as other descriptors such as large, heavy, or plus-sized, but fat is probably the one that will be used most often. I will be describing myself as fat and may use the word fat to describe other people, both fictional and real. I view the word fat as a neutral descriptor, but I understand if others feel that its usage is derogatory and makes them uncomfortable. While I will not be speculating about health in this presentation or speaking about food, if you are sensitive to discussions of size and weight and feel like it may be damaging to your mental health or be triggering to you in any way, it may be best for you to not continue watching beyond this point. I want to acknowledge right away that it feels a bit gross planning to comment on people's bodies in this presentation, particularly when it comes to being critical about the size of their bodies, because I feel like there's a danger of contributing to the problem I merely wish to highlight for discussion. However, pretending there isn't a problem by not addressing this topic at all feels more than gross. It feels wrong. Realistically, any conversation on the topic of fat representation in media necessitates commenting on bodies. And on the condition that media production is a commercial endeavor that commodifies bodies and uses them as visual storytelling tools while valuating certain body types over others, well, on that condition, I'm just going to have to dive in. Now, I'm aware that Bridgerton actress Nicola Coughlin has requested that people not comment on her body. In a message posted to Instagram on July 30th of this year, she says, Hello, so just a thing. If you have an opinion about my body, please, please don't share it with me. Most people are being nice and not trying to be offensive, but I'm just one real life human being and it's really hard to take the weight of thousands of opinions on how you look being sent directly to you every day. If you have an opinion about me, that's okay. I understand I'm on TV and that people will have things to think and say, but I beg you not to send it to me directly. So that was posted on Instagram on July 30th of 2021. Now, since the language she uses in her post specifically mentions that she believes it's okay for people to have things to say about her and goes on to ask that we just not make an attempt to share those opinions with her directly, I will be including the character that Nicola Coughlin portrays in this discussion. Now, Nicola isn't the only actor who's recently asked fans and the media to stop commenting on their body. In October of last year, Jonah Hill made a similar appeal but did not specify that people just not share their opinions full stop, saying, I know you mean well, but I kindly ask that you not comment on my body, good or bad. I want to politely let you know it's not helpful and doesn't feel good. Much respect. So there are countless examples of the real world effects that discourse with a focus on a public figure's body can have on that individual psyche and how fat phobia limits opportunities for everyday people in every industry, not just in film, theater, and television. I'm going to try to keep this discussion narrowly focused on Jane Austen and the Regency era, so I won't be addressing all of the nuances when it comes to the topics of fat representation, fat phobia, and body diversity, or the body positivity movement, 
but I wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge that I'm aware of the broader discussions that are happening and will try to be as sensitive as possible that there will be context that I'm missing. Also, one final note before I really get into it, be prepared for spoilers. If you haven't read or watched the Bridgerton series, Sanditon, Fire Island, and other Regency set costume dramas and read the book series that they're based on, then I might drop some key details about plot points you might not want to have spoiled for you. You've been warned. When we have discussions about diversity in period dramas and in media generally, we often hear a lot of excellent points being made about race, ethnicity, nationality, and even more granular criticisms like the need to represent a wider variety of hair types and even regional dialects and accents, but we hear much less criticism about ensemble casts not including diversity in terms of body type and size. In today's world, the average size of an American woman is between a size 16 and an 18. This is according to a 2016 study published in the International Journal of Fashion Design, Technology, and Education. Similarly, the average size for a woman in the UK is an EU 44 or a UK size 16. When we talk about the term plus sized in fashion, what we mean is sizes 14 through 24, which includes the average woman. Anything beyond a US 24, so 26 and greater, is considered extended sizes, and sometimes these are referred to rather unflatteringly as super sizes, like something off the value menu at a fast food drive through But one important thing to consider is that the average in terms of the general population and the average in terms of performers are pretty far apart. We know that there is a huge disconnect between those two groups. So when I get to the point where I'm discussing individual performers, I need you to understand that the women, in particular the women, are still below average of the general population. For example, we're going to be talking about Nicola Coughlin, who plays Penelope Featherington in Bridgerton. And she's considered a plus size actress, but she is still below the UK average, both in terms of her height and overall size. And for one, I've been able to gather from incredibly sketchy sources on the internet, so take this all with a huge grain of salt, she would not technically be considered plus sized. So in my mind, at least, we still have a long way to go to achieve true body diversity and true fat representation in media. I'm going to take a moment to highlight these three characters who've been featured in recent adaptations that came out in 2021 or 2022. These are Turlow Convery as Arthur Parker in Sanditon, Nicola Coughlin as Penelope Featherington in Bridgerton, and Torian Miller as Max in Fire Island. Penelope Featherington is introduced by Julia Quinn in the popular novels that the Bridgerton Netflix series is based on as being still cloaked in baby fat in an orangey gown which did nothing for her complexion. Elsewhere in the text she's referred to as round and plump, though by the time she's featured as a romantic lead in the book Romancing Mr. Bridgerton, she has lost 30 pounds. In what many have criticized as being a very fat phobic storyline, the presumption is she didn't deserve happiness and love until her body changed to conform to societal beauty standards. Though others have defended this narrative choice and pointed out that there's more to it than just her weight loss. There are things like her fashion choices, and Colin Bridgerton falls in love with her more for her talent and drive than her physical appearance. Uh, full disclosure, I have not read the books, so I'm relying on what my friends in the excellent Fat Girls in Fiction book club have told me. Shout out to Mary and Katie who run the Fat Girls in Fiction blog that sponsors the book club as they were the main inspiration for my decision to take on this topic. We'll have to wait and see how season three of Bridgerton plays out. We do know that it will be Colin and Penelope's turn to be the featured romance. I think indications from Shondaland, the production company responsible for the show, have been that weight loss will not be part of the plot, which I really hope will be the case. I can say that having a fat main character in a Regency set period drama has felt personally empowering to me. 
I love the first season reveal that Pen is Lady Whistledown and how she wields the power she's claimed by taking on the Whistledown persona. I also like seeing the ups and downs in her friendship with Eloise because it gives us a chance to get to know her outside of the context of her romantic relationships, which is something that Daphne and the Sharma sisters don't necessarily benefit from though we do get to see those characters through the lens of their sibling relationships, so it's not like there's no development of them outside of their romantic arcs. I know some of the costuming decisions for Penelope have been unflattering, but as I understand it, there's a valid story reason for that to be the case. I just can't wait for her to really claim her power in the next season. I'm told she's likely going to have a lot more independence in terms of how she dresses and presents herself, so that should be really fun to see. And I know Nicola Coughlin's talked about filming sex scenes and interviews, and I'm here for it. Bring on Bridgerton season three. While I'm lukewarm on Sanditon overall, I think that hard one season two was worth it, if only for Turlo Convery's portrayal of Arthur Parker getting the chance to step up and be the hero we deserve. I'm so pleased with his character development. He's just the real MVP of a season that I personally would have noped out of if not for he and Miss Lamb's friendship carrying me through the psychological torture of Esther. It's 2022. Drugging and gaslighting woman who's dealing with infertility issues is not entertainment. But back to Arthur. From Austin's writings, we have several mentions of Arthur's size. She had had considerable curiosity to see Mr. Arthur Parker, and having fancied him a very puny, delicate-looking young man, materially the smallest of a not very robust family, was astonished to find him quite as tall as his brother, and a great deal stouter broad-made and lusty, and with no other look of an invalid than a sodden complexion. Charlotte's place was by Arthur, who was sitting next to the fire with a degree of enjoyment which gave a good deal of merit of, to his civility in wishing her to take his chair. There was nothing dubious in her manner of declining it, and he sat down again with much satisfaction. She drew back her chair to have all the advantage of his person as a screen, and was very thankful for every inch of his back and shoulders beyond her preconceived idea. Arthur was heavy in eye as well as figure, but by no means indisposed to talk. Austin also spends quite a lot of time explaining Arthur's relationship to food. Arthur was by no means so fond of being starved as they could desire, or as he felt proper himself. He could not get command of the butter, however, without a struggle, for his sisters accusing him of eating a great deal too much and declaring that he was not to be trusted. But as for Arthur, he is only too much disposed for food. We are often obliged to check him. I include these here because I think it shows something, maybe the one thing that the show has gotten really right. Yes, the Arthur we get in the second season succumbs to flattery and is a little too trusting of Discount Lord Byron here, but he's sweet and reluctantly brave and forgoes eating sweets, something that Austin's writings established his love for. And this is out of respect for his friend Miss Lamb, who's advocating a sugar boycott to remove support for the plantation system that enslaves black people. Arthur getting the opportunity to show his innate goodness in large and small ways in season two of Sanditon was a real highlight for me, and I really hope the writers continue to allow him to shine, and maybe even give him a romantic subplot of his own. He deserves it, and frankly, so does the audience. Torian Miller as Max in Fire Island. Fire Island is a modern retelling of Pride and Prejudice that debuted on the streaming platform Hulu earlier this year. It features a group of gay friends vacationing on Fire Island, a real-life LGBTQ plus vacation destination on a barrier island off the coast of New York. It's a really fun update on Austin's works, and the characterizations are spot on. 
Torian plays Max, who's the Mary Bennett of the group. We don't get a whole lot of his performance on screen, but what we do get perfectly captures the Mary Bennett Killjoy vibe. I just wish there were more of it. The closest we get to a physical description of Mary Bennett in Pride and Prejudice is from the closing chapters where Austin writes, Mary was obliged to mix more with the world, but she could still moralize over every morning visit. And as she was no longer mortified by comparisons between her sister's beauty and her own, it was suspected by her father that she submitted to the change without much reluctance. So Mary isn't fat in canon, but she is described as more plain and less beautiful than her sisters. It's been noted many times by scholars how few words Austen devotes to physical description in her books. Instead, we get a lot more exploration of the moral fiber of the characters that she creates. Mary is described as having neither genius nor taste, and though vanity had given her application, it had given her likewise a pedantic air and conceited manner, which would have injured a higher degree of excellence than she had reached. So she's serious and moralizing and interjects these kind of lofty thoughts that really just bring down the vibe. And Max in Fire Island has a few little moments here and there where he gets to be the group's standoffish, slightly judgy pillar of sanity that totally left me wanting more. I wanted to quickly mention a couple of characters from other adaptations set in the Regency period that have been personally impactful for me. Joseph Sedley and William Makepeace Thackeray's Vanity Fair. There have been numerous adaptations over the years of William Makepeace Thackeray's classic Vanity Fair. It was first published in 1847 as a 19-volume serial before being released as a single volume in 1848 with the subtitle A Novel Without a Hero. It is nevertheless set in the year 1814. Joseph Sedley is portrayed as obese, cowardly, and easily manipulated, yet it's still easy to feel sympathy for him partially because of how badly he's treated by his family and erstwhile love interest Becky Sharp, and partially because every other character that populates the story is just deeply terrible and wholly without redeeming characteristics, <laughs> hence the, the subtitle, A Novel Without a Hero. Thackeray's descriptions of Joseph are numerous and unflattering. He's a very stout, puffy man in buckskins and hessian boots with several immense neckcloths that rose almost to his nose, with a red-striped waistcoat and an apple-green coat with steel buttons almost as large as crown pieces. It was the morning costume of a dandy, or blood of those days, was reading the paper by the fire when the two girls entered and bounced off his armchair and blushed excessively and hid his entire face almost in his neckcloth at this apparition. So Joseph is a swell, which in this case does not refer to his size, but rather this is 18th century slang, meaning fashionably dressed or exhibiting puffed up pompous behavior. Most of my affection for the character comes from the fact that his costumes are so over the top and fun in the filmed adaptations. In the text, Thackeray rarely misses an opportunity to remind us of Joseph's fatness. The praise thrilled through every fiber of his big body and it made it tingle with pleasure. Joseph Sedley heaved something very like a sigh out of his big chest. Miss Sharp, from her little bedroom on the second floor, was an observation until Mr. Joseph's great form should heave in sight. This is just a small selection of the references to Joseph Sedley's size and weight that fill the pages of Vanity Fair. This, among many other factors, may get a difficult read, and I'm always grateful that it's been adapted to film so often, so I can experience the story in a visually fulfilling way without having to struggle through the text. Jack Aubrey in the Master and Commander series. There are 20 completed novels in the Master and Commander series by Patrick O'Brien, and I have read them all, plus the unfinished 21st volume that was published posthumously in the author's own horrendous handwriting. The film adaptation starring Russell Crowe as Lucky Jack Aubrey was released in 2003, 
and it is a masterpiece. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you do so after you finish watching this video. It's an interesting story for fans of Jane Austen to get stuck into because it offers a top-down view of the times that Austen lived and wrote in that she wasn't able to capture in her more intimate domestic works. If you've ever wondered to yourself what Captain Wentworth's life at sea might have been like, Patrick O'Brien's books will give you a pretty good idea of the life of a sailor in Nelson's Royal Navy. Though the first book was written in 1969, it takes place in the year 1800 to 1801 and details a real historical event from the life of a naval captain named Thomas Cochrane. Aubrey's weight is specifically recorded in the text at 18 stone or 250 pounds, and his friend and shipmate Dr. Maturin frequently frets about his weight and tries to get him to eat less, but he's fond of dining well and keeping a well-stocked wine cellar, and he uses invitations to the captain's table as a tool for keeping his officers happy and for keeping up to speed on what's happening with his crew. Despite his size, he's described as an athletic and physically powerful man, still able to climb into the ship's rigging and race men half his age to the crow's nest. When Russell Crowe took on the role, he reportedly gained weight in preparation for shooting, but he did not gain the full amount that was expected. In an interview, he said, there are fans out there who are disgruntled because I didn't do the role at 17 stone, 238 pounds. In the books, Aubrey ranges from 14 to 17 stone, sometimes on the same voyage. The interviewer asks, did you gain that much for the role? Russell Crowe replies, we were going in that direction, but about six weeks out, Peter said, you know what, I think we should cut down the weight. He wanted Aubrey to be active, to be able to go up in the rigging and be a sailor. How big were you thinking of going? Brando big? Referring to actor Marlon Brando, who was widely criticized for his weight, particularly when he began filming Apocalypse Now in 1979 and arrived on set at a weight that didn't fit with director Francis Ford Coppola's vision for the character as lean and hungry. So Crow goes on to answer, no, but that's what 17 stone would have looked like on my frame, and that would have just been untenable, just in terms of getting up and down the fucking stairways. So we didn't go that far. I'm not Adonis, but I'm not Rompole of the Bailey either. And if you, like me, have no idea what Crow is referring to there, let me enlighten you. Rumpel of the Bailey was a British television series that ran from the late 70s to the early 90s starring Leo McKern as Barrister Horace Rumpel. Now we know. Fat characters from the Austin canon. There are several characters whose size is specifically mentioned by Austin in her writings. Among these we have Mr. Rushworth in Mansfield Park. He's described as being a heavy young man with not more than common sense. Harriet Smith in Emma. She was short, plump, and fair, with a fine bloom, blue eyes, light hair, and regular features. Mr. Collins in Pride and Prejudice. He is introduced to us as a tall, heavy-looking young man of five and twenty. Mrs. Palmer in Sense and Sensibility. Mrs. Palmer was short and plump, had a very pretty face, and the finest expression of good humor in it that could possibly be. John Thorpe in Northanger Abbey. He was a stout young man of middling height, who with a plain face and ungraceful form, seemed fearful of being too handsome. Mrs. Musgrove in Persuasion. Mrs. Musgrove was of a comfortable, substantial size. Now the passage where Mrs. Musgrove is described continues with him using on size that I think is worth studying a little bit more in depth. They, Captain Wentworth and Anne, were actually on the same sofa, for Mrs. Musgrove had most readily made room for him. They were divided only by Mrs. Musgrove. It was no insignificant barrier indeed. Mrs. Musgrove was of a comfortable, substantial size infinitely more fitted by nature to express good cheer and good humor than tenderness and sentiment, and while the agitations of Anne's slender form and pensive face may be considered as very completely screened, 
Captain Wentworth should be allowed some credit for the self-command with which he attended to her large, fat sighings over the destiny of a son whom alive nobody had cared for. Personal size and mental sorrow have certainly no necessary proportions. A large, bulky figure has as good a right to be in deep affliction as the most graceful set of limbs in the world. But fair or not fair, there are unbecoming conjunctions, which reason will patronize in vain, which taste cannot tolerate, which ridicule will seize. By which Jane Austen seems to acknowledge the societal inclination to mock fat people for their earnest expressions of emotion, and the expectation for fat people to smooth over mockery with jokes and by playing the clown. And last but not least, we have this description of Mrs. Jennings from Sense and Sensibility, which bears the distinction of being the only time Jane Austen used the term fat to describe a person in her novels, though there are several instances of her usage of fat in her letters. One thing I found really interesting when I was searching the text for descriptions of Mrs. Jennings was this line that reads, Mrs. Jennings was a widow with an ample jointure. Now, at first, I thought this was another reference to her size, but I looked into the term and it turns out that jointure refers to an estate or property settled on a woman at marriage to be owned by her in the event of her husband's death. So it has nothing to do with bodies or appearance at all, but to personal wealth. It's also interesting to note that Austin uses the word large often, but almost always in reference to personal wealth and to describe property and homes. I have particular affection for Elizabeth Spriggs' portrayal of Mrs. Jennings in the 1995 adaptation. Spriggs would later be featured in the first Harry Potter films as a character known only as the Fat Lady, the magical portrait who guards the secret doorway to the Gryffindor common room. It is a truth universally acknowledged that if one is casting the heroine of an Austen adaptation, one never casts a plus-sized actress. The lack of body diversity in Austen adaptations has had such a profound impact on my historical costuming aspirations that it would be hard to overstate the effects. The fact that Austen spends so little time describing her characters should lend itself to leaving the door wide open when it comes to casting, yet we've consistently been stuck with wafy white women playing Austen heroines. And I'll be the first to admit that the bulk of these performances have been stellar, but the sameness is wearing thin. Puns not intended, but I loan it. This is the part of the discussion that I've really been dreading because while I feel like it's important to provide concrete examples of how little diversity there's been in the casting of Austin heroes and heroines over the years, I want to do it in a way that's as conscious as possible of the harm that this discussion could do. I will be referring to performers I highlight here by comparing them to the population averages. Also, in the interest of saving time, I've elected not to put together the same sort of roundups for the male leads. This is both because there has traditionally been a lot more media attention on women's bodies, and also because of my own biases, leading me to think more deeply about how women are represented in the media than men. Emma has been adapted numerous times, and in these adaptations, even Harriet Smith, the canon plump character, often gets cast to be played by a slim actress. Anya Taylor-Joy is a literal fashion model who has above average height and below average weight. Ramala Garai, again above average height and below average weight. In 2012, she told The Telegraph that as a size 10, she's too fat for Hollywood. 10, though a size or two above most of the other actresses in these roundups, is still far below the general population average. She also appeared alongside Reese Witherspoon in the 2004 adaptation of Vanity Fair, and aside from being bustier and taller than Witherspoon, the main difference between them is that Garai has a naturally rounder face than Witherspoon's sharp-chinned, V-shaped face. 
And Gwyneth Paltrow is another actress with above average height and below average weight. In 2001, she starred in the movie Shallow Hal, which required her to wear a fat suit to play Rosemary. The movie, written by the Farrelly brothers of Dumb and Dumber and There's Something About Mary fame, is a disaster. It professes to preach body acceptance and the importance of inner beauty while consistently undermining its own messaging with cheap fat jokes. The irony of the film's leading man being an actual fat person, Jack Black, is almost completely lost in the script. And despite this, it has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 50%. Whereas somehow the new Netflix adaptation of Persuasion has a 30% rating. Alicia Silverstone as Cher in Clueless. Alicia Silverstone was 16 years old while filming Clueless and must have absorbed some of her co star Paul Rudd's famous anti aging magic because at 45 she remains stunningly beautiful. She recently responded to a paparazzi photo of her in a sundress being labeled as fat with a TikTok video that is frankly iconic. The trend continues when we take into consideration the many Pride and Prejudice adaptations and spin-offs we've had over the years. Jennifer Eel from the 1995 adaptation is the same height as Kira Knightley. They're both above the average. She is, of course, below average weight. Kira Knightley from the 2005 adaptation, it will come as no surprise, is of uh, above average height and below average weight. Anna Maxwell in Death Comes to Pemberley from 2013. Near average height, still slightly above, she is below the average weight. Lily James in Pride and Prejudice and Zombies from 2016. Lily James is the same height as Kira Knightley and Jennifer Eel. She is likewise below average weight. She famously tight laced down to a 17 inch waist for the Cinderella live action adaptation from a natural 22 inch waist. She had to be on a liquid diet because while wearing the dress during filming, she couldn't eat solid food due to her digestive tract being too restricted to function properly. Now, when audiences first saw the previews for the film, there were accusations that CGI was used to make her waist appear smaller than physically possible, but those rumors were rejected by Disney. Sense and Sensibility. Though there have only been two recent Sense and Sensibility adaptations, both, while excellent, have featured more of the same in terms of body diversity. Kate Winslet is the same height as Jennifer Eel, Kira Knightley, and Lily James, and was below average weight when she appeared in Sense and Sensibility at age 19 in 1995. She filmed Titanic directly afterward and was reportedly a size 8 though she still received criticism at the time about her weight. I remember seeing some of the Titanic costumes at a Planet Hollywood restaurant in Orlando, Florida in 1997, shortly before the film premiered. Now, this was Jack's borrowed tuxedo and Rose's jet beaded jump dress. And I remember thinking, even in my teenage body, that was probably a size 10 or 12 at the time, and even with the mannequins up on plinths that put the waist above my eye level, I just remember thinking that actors and actresses were just small people. <laughs> Recently, Kate Winslet has been receiving a lot of praise for her body. While filming Mayor of Easttown, she refused to let the production cut parts of her nude sex scenes that showed imperfections and rolls on her stomach. Her size fluctuates, but it's either close to the average or right at the average for the UK, which is a size 14. Emma Thompson is above average height and below average weight. She mentions on the commentary track of Sense and Sensibility that she lost weight between the time that the costumes were fitted and when they filmed the London ball scene so that the bodice of her ball gown didn't fit well and gapped at the top. She's worn a fat suit for many of her subsequent roles, including a bit of padding in her role as Karen in Love Actually, and prosthetics including cheek plumpers in her titular role in Nanny McPhee, a children's film in which a magical nanny's physical ugliness mirrors the behavior 
and moral character of the children under her care. Now, as the children learn to be more well-behaved, Nanny McPhee loses her snaggletooth, large facial mole, and other features until she ends the film as lovely as Emma Thompson herself, surrounded by polite, disciplined children. And her most recent role of Agatha Trunchbull in the new Matilda adaptation has her wearing a very large fat suit and has come under criticism due to the fact that thin actresses wearing fat suits takes away an opportunity for a fat actress to be cast. Personally, I find the flawed morality in both Nanny McPhee and Matilda that fat and ugly equals bad, evil, or morally bankrupt to be a bad message to be marketing to children. I have less to say about the actresses from the 2008 adaptation, but I'm much less familiar with their work and I'm not aware of any controversial roles that either have taken. Hattie Morahan's height is above average. It's the same as Emma Thompson's, in fact, and her weight is below average. Charity Wakefield is slightly above average height and below average weight. Honestly, I could go on and on in this vein, but I think we've all gotten the point. Mostly, you have to look very closely in the backgrounds of ball scenes to catch a brief glimpse of fat extras dancing to see any bodies like mine in these films and shows I love. When fat performers do get speaking roles in Austin adaptations, they're tertiary characters and not the romantic leads. This is why having Nicola Coughlin as Penelope Featherington and Bridgerton is so impactful for me. Seeing someone with a shape similar to my own inhabiting the stories I care so much about is cathartic. Over the past year, I've started to see so many average-sized people making their first gowns or ensembles to attend the Bridgerton Experience Queen's Ball, and I've begun following some plus-size historical costumers on social media who inspire me to take on some sewing projects I've dreamt of for literally decades. I'm particularly a fan of Amy Coombs of Dressing Miss Dashwood, who's created so many Regency-era ensembles that I admire. Almost every photo she posts online could be the cover of a romance novel, I swear. Marissa Zimmerman from the Plush Seamstress blog has been making some incredible costumes from a variety of eras, including Regency styles. She was recently named the Diamond of the Season at one of the Bridgerton Experience Balls, and the video of the glitter confetti falling on her as she stood on a pedestal made me want to book my own tickets to the experience so, so bad. Rebecca Maiden of Lady Rebecca Fashions on Instagram and YouTube has done several Regency dresses, but she makes other costumes from a stunning range of time periods. I'm seriously in awe of her talent. If you get a chance to check out her videos, they're very good. Laughing with Lizzie is an influencer account that is right up there with Dressing Miss Dashwood for posting photos that look like movie stills. She has a range of gorgeous dresses and some fabulous accessories that I covet. My personal experience of inclusivity as a fat person interested in historical costuming has been that there are a lot of challenges that straight-sized people don't have. Though I have found the community of Austinites and cosplayers and historical reenactors to be very welcoming. First things first, you can forget about purchasing historical garments off the rack as a fat person. I've looked high and low for gowns in my size to purchase and wasn't able to find anything ready-made. There are just a lot of dead ends as you search retail sites. Even when I sent my body measurements to a maker, I had bad luck. <laughs> My Star Trek command uniform was ordered from a maker who was supposed to be, you know, fitting to my measurements, but I've never been able to wear it. And same with a set of Yule Ball dress robes I ordered from a retailer. I sent them my measurements. They scaled up one of their straight size pieces, but it didn't fit in some key areas, making it unwearable. The one exception has been visiting Cassandra's Closet booth at the Jane Austen Festival in Louisville, Kentucky, where I was able to purchase a much-needed Regency petticoat right off the rack. 
I had to adjust the shoulder straps later, but it fit my girth and height very well as it was. Accessories are hard to find in sizes that work as well. Gloves, even the stretchy satin prom gloves, won't fit larger forearms. Stockings often don't fit larger thighs, and shoes don't come in wide sizing. Even things you would think would be safe purchases, like necklaces, can have sizing issues. Amanda Stewart says, for historical necklaces, most are 15 inches and have a chain or a ribbon to give extra length. Where I like to have mine rest is around 19 inches, so there's a wide gap. If the custom jewelry makers maybe offered an option on their sites to add in a few extra links as a purchasable option versus having to contact them for a custom quote, it might encourage more people to order them. Not sure about anyone else, but I despise asking for something special to accommodate my larger size. It's like having to ask for a seatbelt extender on a plane rather than just having the seatbelts be long enough to fit larger bodies. I will say trying to find kid skin gloves in larger sizes has been a nightmare. Vintage are tiny. Most custom places won't do larger upper arm measurements. I managed to find one place who had a wide debutante glove, but even those were snug. I've made gloves before and didn't wish to repeat the experience, but I could have saved a lot of time, money, and stress by making my own from scratch. Rebecca Sandal says, by going to the drag queen sites, I can get high thigh highs and gloves. Still must make my own garters and garter belts though. Christina Wenzel says, even if you find some shoes that fit around the foot itself, I have wide ankles and calves too. And there it's impossible to find Christina Wenzel says, even if you find some shoes that fit around the foot itself, I have wide ankles and calves too. And there it's impossible for me to find shoes slash boots that fit. Danny Bonine, I have wide fat feet and finding women's historical shoes is impossible. The advice is to either size up or buy men's. No one wants to even attempt to accommodate a non-standard foot. Sewing patterns that are available in craft and fabric stores from the companies collectively known as the Big Four, Vogue, McCall's, Butterick, and Simplicity, often don't come in plus sizes. Even when you include their usually generous ease and seam allowances, the sizing tops out at a size 20 or 22. I'm in 24 and there are a few patterns that I can make work for me, but I generally do some ad hoc adjustments like adding inches to sleeves and drafting my own skirt instead of using the provided pattern pieces. Many plus size costumers have become skilled at pattern grading by necessity. Um, pattern grading is the process of turning a sample size into additional sizes using grading increments. Others have learned how to draft their own patterns. Claricia Depiferi, sorry if I've mangled your name. I do my own sewing and most of my own pattern drafting, but from observation, Large or round is usually equated to tall. Even the Bara method has some flaws, but is a massive improvement on paper patterns. At least it uses your own proportions. Susan Haney says, I always make my own historical costumes, and this is out of necessity rather than frugality. The clothes that I've seen off the rack are either not historically accurate enough or would have to be altered to fit anyway, since I'm tall and short-waisted as well as big. Therefore I, either, therefore, I either draft or drape my own patterns, or I use specialty pattern makers like Truly Victorian and Black Snail because of their inclusive sizing, and then modify the patterns from there. I rarely use the Big Four patterns because they only go up to a size 22, which I can only fit in because of the ridiculous amount of ease they put in, and they're not even that historically accurate. There are many independent uh, pattern publishers that specialize in recreating patterns based on extant historical garments, and most of these make their patterns available in extended sizes. Uh, Callie Metcalf says, I love how inclusive the Laughing Moon Mercantile is. They've now gone to PDF only, but their sizes are 4 to 34 and are all included, so I feel good about investing in my own copies. I trace the size I need and already have the option of other sizes if my weight changes too much. Black Snail Patterns are also good on the size-inclusive front. 
Rebecca Posey says, my measurements are usually larger or at the top end of most patterns that I've used. I cannot use the big commercial pattern companies like Simplicity and McCall's without having to grade up 10 plus inches. I have had a lot of great experience with Truly Victorian, Black Snail Patterns, Laughing Moon Mercantile, and Scroop Patterns. With all of those, I usually use the largest size and make small adjustments, or if I'm very lucky, no adjustments at all. Amanda Stewart says, Truly Victorian is a godsend for size inclusivity. It helps that the designer is curvy herself. Laughing Moon is a staple as well, and Black Snail Patterns are quickly becoming a favorite too. All patterns need mock-ups and adjustments though, given my large bust. My own experiences of being a pattern tester for fig leaf patterns is that I had to make similar adjustments to the butter dress pattern I'm wearing in this photo. <laughs> That's me at the fig leaf sewing retreat. I had to add several inches in the sleeve of each garment to make them fit around my arms. And even though I had the pattern maker right there in the room with me, I still managed to need to add a couple of inches to the back pieces after I'd gotten everything cut and sewn for the bodice. Thank you so much for joining me here at Virtual Jane Con and for contributing to this discussion. I'm Lacey Phillips, if you happen to miss that. I hope you got a lot out of this presentation. If you are interested in exploring more positive fat representation in media, I can't recommend the Fat Girls in Fiction Book Club highly enough. You can find them on all of the social platforms as well as at their website, fatgirlsinfiction.com. I want to thank Bianca Hernandez Knight for putting Virtual Jane Con together again this year, as well as all of the fantastic volunteers behind the scenes who worked so hard at developing the community guidelines and moderation standards and for putting together the truly outstanding program we have this year. Be sure to check out Tiffany Gale's presentation coming up next, titled When Cassandra Mourned Jane, which will talk about mourning traditions and fashion during the Regency period. Thank you so much again.